Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Hello and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders, the Authority Positioning Coach. Today we have with us Don Purcell, who's a certified Kingdom Advisor and founder of Clarity Business Coaching. Don, welcome to the program. Welcome. Glad to be here. Hey, well, I'm excited to talk to you because I know we want to talk about having a plan. And I know that when we use the word plan, P-L-A-N, boy, that's a broad term. So we want to talk about it in relation to a business, you know, a business plan, entrepreneurial path. So um, what all goes into that? Um, what is a plan? And uh, what are some of the benefits of having a plan? So get us, get us started th- um, um, talking through that process from your perspective. Well, I'd like to start with a quote from uh, Eisenhower, our World War II general and uh, U.S. president. He said, plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. Ooh. And you got to ask, what does, what does he mean by this seemingly self-canceling declaration? You know, the planning, the process of planning uh, identifies potential opportunities and pitfalls uh, in business. And, you know, much like the battlefield, there are many moving parts that include prospects, competitors, allies, colleagues, uh, the business leadership, actions by the federal state government, new entrance to the market, and ge- geopolitical and macroeconomic factors. So uh, all of these things you have to take into account in the planning process, but the plan itself may become obsolete because of new developments, but by identifying uh, the potential new developments, you are better prepared for when they happen. You know, you mentioned, um, you know, I I love alliteration. And so you mentioned planning and pitfalls and um, process. And it made me think about um, another P. So if through the planning process, you identify some potential pitfalls, could that require a pivot, not necessarily let's crumble up the piece of paper and start from scratch, but it might just require, you know what, we're on a good track here, um, but maybe we ought to just adjust it right here. So it's, it's, a, it's a pivot, right? I mean, that's, that's not a bad thing in business. It's, it's really learning from this planning process and going, okay, we're going to stay the course, but we're going to just take this new angle right here. Well, it, you know, planning implies that you ha- establish goals. Yeah. And you begin uh, with the end in mind, uh, to paraphrase uh, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, that, you know, if you take off in an airplane from Orlando, Florida, to go to Los Angeles, you have a goal or a plan to get to Los Angeles. But along the way, you're going to be off course many, many times, weather, winds, uh, air traffic, so the pilot is constantly making those tweaks and adjustments that if he didn't make, he'd end up in Chicago instead of Los Angeles and make a drastic adjustment way down the road. So it is the process of planning and establishing goals is so important, even though you recognize you're going to be off course much of the time. You know, goals are, are so important. Uh, and if if you don't realize let me use an analogy, a sports analogy from basketball. What if the team, you know, we've got March Madness going on right now. What if the team arrives at the at the field house and there are no basketball goals? There's no hoop or rim, no backboard, and the coach says, get out there and play hard. Well, what does that mean? You know, yeah. there's nothing to shoot at. Uh, so you have to have goals to uh, be organized and and. Uh, get the most pr- productivity out of your people. Yeah, that's a really great point because uh, beginning with the end in mind means this is the direction that, that I'm heading. And unfortunately, many times people spend more time and energy and effort planning their vacation than their personal or professional life. <laughs> so true. So true. And, and that is why it, 
you know, weekly meetings are so important to make sure everyone's still on the same page, rowing in the same direction. Uh, teamwork is so important uh, that if, if you're all pulling in the same direction, you're much more powerful than having different agendas and, you know, po- office politics can pop up to throw you off course and people are uh, politicking for position and power rather than focusing on on the goals and what you set out to accomplish. So uh, with the planning process, you need accountability. You know, you need to look into one pair of eyes and said, you are accountable for this, this, and this. And we want to know next week where you stand on these three items. That, you know, in, ensures productivity and focusing on the most important thing, prioritizing uh, what's the most important thing to do first and, and getting, you know, focusing on those goals of the business. And, and I'm, and I, you know, you mentioned the Eisenhower quote. We've mentioned Stephen Covey, so let's throw in another one in the mix. I don't remember. I want to say Tom Peters, maybe, but he said something to the effect of what gets measured gets done. So that's that accountability factor. If you don't think someone's going to come behind you and check and double check, then maybe it doesn't get done right, or maybe it doesn't get done at all. Right. And having uh, a weekly scorecard of focusing on what's going on in the business provides that feedback loop that you're focusing on what's important that week to get done. I recently helped a startup business owner uh, develop her weekly scorecard, and we identified 10 leading indicators or KPIs, key performance indicators, that measured business performance. You know, previously she'd just been using the monthly profit and loss statement, which is, you know, after the fact, a lagging indicator, and using how much cash she had in the bank, which is simply a snapshot of, with no context of where the business is going. And the scorecard keeps 13 weeks of data, so trends can be spotted before they become crises or, or, uh, missed opportunities. Uh, examples of things on the scorecard is a number of ads placed, Number of customer referrals, like volume of phone calls coming in or, or on the phone or the website, number of new customers, and, and for her business, the cost of diesel was, is a key indicator. Huh. Uh, and because of, uh, competitor developments, she recently had a 25% jump in new customers in, in less than two weeks. So without seeing what's going on and having a plan and having that feedback loop, uh, she wouldn't have been prepared to take advantage of that those that jump in customers and and make a profitable pivot to be twenty five percent larger and, and virtually overnight you know that's a really good point is um that preparation because yes, it might not have been catastrophic if you got that you know, metric in and then thought, ooh, now I need to do these things. But then you're behind the curve. It's like Wayne Gretzky saying, you know, I skate where the puck is headed. Well, if you aim for where it is right now, you get there and then it's already two steps ahead. So seeing some of these contingencies, having these KPIs and going, okay, let's manage to this or, or you know, make sure that we're managing um, our expectations correctly. Then when that happens, okay, you're prepared. If it doesn't happen, you're prepared. So I think that preparation, you know, measure twice, cut once is such a great uh, um, acron- uh, um, thought to keep in mind. So true. So true. That... Well, I was, I think, too, another th- thought that comes to my mind, and maybe you'll agree with this, is, um, okay, you you know you need a plan. Plan is good. Um, what about implementing that plan? Because you could spend all this time and go, here's the plan. Here's the KPIs. here. And then you high five figuratively or literally, and then you never re-review and you never implement or you never implement fully. And, and then that comes into the accountability. But I talk a little bit about the importance of, you know, putting that plan into action. Well, that is so true that many people go through the planning process, finish the final draft of the plan, and then put it on a shelf where it collects dust. Yeah. They, they need to get real in the planning process and tie it to what's going on in the business on a day-to-day, week-to-week uh, time frame. You know, if you if you let a 
a month or three months go by before you get back together to re- review where you're going and you have different people with the different ideas that, that have gone up in different directions, you've lost three months of productivity. Whereas if you stay on top with weekly meetings, identifying what your weekly to-dos are, and 90% of those should get done every week, and what your three-month uh, rocks or priorities are, uh, then you you keep on track of those longer-term goals so that uh, you, you don't lose productivity time. You know, too often businesses are so busy, business owners are so busy working in the business, putting out fires and, and whatnot, that they're not working on the business, improving yes. processes, being, being prepared for growth. Uh, I mean, because it's having repeatable processes that ensures profitable growth. You know, you mentioned the to-do list, and let's look at the antithesis or opposite of that. How about the not-to-do list? You know, I mean, yeah, we need to have these to-dos, but there also should be a, another side of that equation, which is, now listen, we're not going to be doing whatever, any activity that requires. Or it, So, I mean, I think that at the same time that we need to say, here's our to-do list, there should be like an overarching, now you're not going to sit down and say, oh, I spent the first 10 minutes of my day creating my to-do list, and then I spent another 10 minutes creating my to-don't list. Well, that's not feasible, but I think there should be a conscious realization of, here's some, we don't do these things. And maybe the CEO needs to go, you know what, my hourly rate is X, and um, the highest and best use of my time is not bullet point, bullet point, bullet point. You know, I need to be having other people do these things so that I'm freed up to do these. So I think there's that nice balance there, right? Yeah, there's a process of identifying the things you're you're good at and you enjoy doing, things you're you're great at and you enjoy doing things you're uh, good at and you don't enjoy and things you're not good and you, and you don't enjoy it and dividing your daily activities or weekly activities into those four quadrants identifies what needs to be delegated to a lower level employee because you never want a dollar doing a nickel's work. Yes. And for sure. What, what tasks you want to keep on your own plate and this helps identify staffing needs going forward. You know, that if you have uh, one of the business leaders uh, driving a truck, instead of uh, leading and managing uh, his staff, that's a dollar doing a nickel's work. It's a poor use of his time. So it's uh, having the discipline to do your highest and, and best uh, tasks to move the business forward. And when you say some of the to don'ts, what brings comes to my mind is the office culture. You know, yeah. you, you don't want uh, politicking, backstabbing, gossip, uh, and you want to express uh, to your peers, subordinates, and, and supervisors. Uh, patience, kindness, and courtesy, because you can get a lot more done if you respect individuals and so that they don't spend time, you know, smarting from being chewed out in front of their peers. Yeah. That if, uh, you know, the the boss can express what uh, he or she needs to instruct the staff with uh, patience, kindness, and courtesy, it's going to go a long way for productivity. Yeah, you know, that's, uh, I think we could spend probably four and a half more hours on that one statement alone. So let's let's kind of uh, merge into the next piece that um, having a plan uh, has, which is it's got to be put on that foundation. You know, what's the best foundation that a plan is built on? And I like to think of it like, um, hey, here's this blueprint and uh talk to the architect, we want to build this house and look at all these wonderful things, rooms and this and that and the other, but um, the piece of ground we're putting it on is on a, a faulty foundation. Well, then it's not going to last. So true. You know, Christ said that a house built on sand is going to be washed away in the flood, whereas a house built on rock is going to withstand wind and hurricanes. And, and I, 
use that analogy as the foundation of basing my business philosophy on the truth of Scripture. You know, there are, there are over 2,300 verses in the Bible about money and possessions, and there's great wisdom to be found there. And, and when I mention patient kindness and courtesy, that's from 1 Corinthians 13, about what God's love is about. So you can be a, an effective business leader basing uh, your business philosophy on Scripture and and find your miles ahead of uh, other people that are still figuring out what a good foundation is. Yeah. There, there's so many great examples of uh, where Scripture gives you good wisdom, like from Second Timothy, don't have anything to do with stupid arguments. You know, people too often get involved on things that are not important and argue about irrelevant and, and petty little things. Uh, another one of my favorite is avoiding debt from Proverbs, just as the rich rule over the poor, the borrower is servant to the lender. You know, yeah. that can be applied both in personal and business. Uh, so... Now, here's a question on that, and, and I don't want to get into the weeds too deeply, but um, do you feel like there is good debt and bad debt? In, in, let's just use that, the business as an example. So, you know, you could say, oh, well, I, I need to buy you know, equipment, and, and it's a lot of money, so I need to borrow that and make payments on it. Um, but the equipment will allow us to get this job and increase our cash flow. And we can afford the payment, so that's not constricting to our cash flow. Is there a time where that debt decision is good um, and still can be adhering to the scriptural principle of, you know, n not being in debt or being a debtor? All right. That's, uh, scripture doesn't prohibit debt. And taking on debt to uh, in, on an asset that's going to increase in value or generate profits is certainly uh, reasonable, and but the, the balance is keeping in mind that that you know God does not promise us tomorrow. So, whereas debt says, "Well, we'll we'll pay it off going forward," well, things may may not happen that way. Uh, still, if so, you weigh uh, the the taking on debt versus not taking on debt versus uh, you know, you weigh that decision carefully as opposed to a business owner that, you know, goes willy nilly and charges everything and runs up a credit line and uh, just to cover ordinary operating expenses or, yeah. or, or, or uh, ill advised uh, spending habits. Uh, that too many people, you know, get caught up in the debt cycle, because debt is promoted everywhere we turn in, in culture. You know, the credit card companies have ads on TV and, you know, and equate uh, uh, lavish spending on gifts and, and entertainment. Uh, because you deserve it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And It ties into pride at that point. Sure. sure. So, you know, I, I focus on uh, being thoughtful about taking on debt and understanding uh, the difficulty it might be in paying that off. That's a really, really good point. So let's uh, let's shift gears into we need to have a plan. We need to make sure that the process is prudently planned out and there should be accountability. It needs to be implemented. It should be on a solid foundation of scriptural principles. And that all sounds good. And maybe a business owner is nodding their head, checking the box, going, agree, agree, agree. But uh, I don't know where to start. <laughs> so what are the benefits of having someone come alongside you and kind of give you that guidance and then also point out some areas that, um, you know, like the old saying, you can't see the forest for the trees. Well, maybe that third party perspective is really critical and helpful. Oh, so true. And and I'll quote Proverbs again. You know, if you refuse good advice, you will watch your plans fail. But if you take mm. good counsel and you can watch them succeed. So a good advisor will give you a perspective that you may not uh, may not realize. The, a good advisor can identify the unknown unknowns. You know the the things you hadn't thought about coming out of left field that that uh, 
could smack you in the head and, and bring you down. So having good counsel helps uh, the advisor benefit from the uh, helps the business owner benefit from the advisor's experience with many other clients and in, in, in many other industries. So you uh, you know don't have to go through the school of hard knocks yourself. You, the school of learning from others' mistakes is a much easier road to take. Yeah. Well, and and um, also, wouldn't you want, if at all possible, wouldn't you want to learn a lesson based on someone else's mistakes rather than you having to go through it and feel that pain and go, oh, that was really painful. I better not do that again. I'd rather have Don go, hey, listen, I'm not proud of this, but I, I made this mistake in my business years ago, but here's how I got through it. Here's how I um, rose above it. And in your situation, you're heading, you're heading that same spot. So here's what we need to do. All right. You know, from my own personal life, I'm the second of two uh, sons, and I learned a wealth of what not to do by my older brother. That uh, I I saw what what he did and and said, well, that wasn't a good idea. So I, I think I'll avoid it, or at least I'll know how not to get caught. It's being a little bit of a mischief as a teenager, but that that principle still holds you know, later in life, that if you can benefit from someone else's experience, you don't have to make those same mistakes again in your own life. And And just like we said about a minute ago, like Wall Street saying you deserve this and pride, don't let pride of, oh, I'm good, I'm good. Listen to these people coming alongside you, whether it's an advisor or a colleague or a or another business owner that you're in a mastermind with. Listen to them and and let that be maybe the prompting of the Holy Spirit saying, you know what, maybe you should. And, and, and it's like when you play chess and you leave your finger on the piece and you look around. Okay, is this a good move? Okay, yeah, it is. Or no, it's not. Let me pull it back. So don't let your own you know way of doing things or this is the way tradition or pride get into not listening to maybe what some wise counsel right in front of you is telling you, and it could avoid some great things. Right. The, the American culture promotes rugged individualism. Yeah. But the reality is, uh, you know, if you have many advisors, your plans are going to succeed because you, you bring that experience and perspective of several other people uh, to help you avoid those pitfalls and, and well, uh, I'd hate to be that rugged individualist that doesn't listen to people, makes bad decision, and then you end up being a haggard individual <laughs> because yeah. of how you've been run through the ringer. So that's a, such such great advice, Don. I really appreciate that. So let's uh, let's wrap up with uh, someone's listening to this going. You know what? A couple of those nuggets of truth rung true to me. What's the best way someone can reach out and connect with you and learn a little bit more about your services? Well, they can go to my website, cbizcoach.co. That's the letter C, B I Z, C O A C H dot C O. And there you can learn a little bit more about me and uh, book an appointment, uh, no cost, no obligation appointment, where I'll give you 60 minutes of my time, offer you perspective on how I might be able to help uh, your particular situation and, and uh, how, to, how I can serve you best. Because my my purpose in life is uh, to to serve people to the glory of God. It's my purpose in business and in in my personal life is serving others. Love it. That's so awesome. Thank you. I really appreciate your time and love your perspective on life and business. So thank you for coming on today, Don. Thank you. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.